The Truth About Goblins Chapter 2 Once they pressed the button, the elevator doors began to close, and Annie could do nothing but watch her last chance of escape disappear. It was almost more than she could take. If she had been emotional, she probably would have broken down into tears right then and there, in the middle of the elevator, in front of her two captors and the crazy kid beside her. But Annie had never been emotional. She stayed silent. By now, the anxiety was wearing off, leaving her with nothing to deal with but bitter anger. She felt stupid for trying to run, and for trusting a stranger against her better judgment. If it hadn't been for him, she might have escaped. But instead, there they were, partners in crime. They stood in silence, the men in suits towering over them. Even if there wasn't anywhere to run, they kept a firm grip on the kids' shoulders, just in case they tried anything else. Annie, of course, had given up by now. She was in enough trouble already. She glanced around the cramped elevator, watching as one of the men pulled out a key and opened a secret compartment below the dashboard. As the panel flipped open, it revealed a collection of levers and switches, all of them unfamiliar to her. What were they for? But the man was only interested in one button. He leaned in, pushed it, and watched it flash blue only to lock the panel up again once he was done. Not long after, the elevator began its descent. Annie felt a jolt as it passed the ground floor, then the basement. She waited for the next jolt, expecting the elevator to stop. But there was no jolt, and it didn't stop. It kept going down. Oh no! She was really in trouble now. Annie looked to her right to see what the other kid thought about it, but he didn't seem worried at all. He was paying more attention to the teddy bear in his arms than anything else. It looked like one of the stuffed animals from the mall. Had he really taken the time to swipe it before being forced into the elevator? She glared at him. What's wrong with this kid? The boy caught her gaze. He looked away soon after, shuffling his feet. Another stretch of silence, and he offered her the bear. You want it? She ripped the bear out of his hands and whipped it back at his face. What's wrong with you? Jeepers, he said, catching the stuffed animals. Could have at least said thanks. Do you not like bears or what? Bears she exclaimed. Bears! Are you serious? You have got to be kidding me. Do you realize how much trouble we're in? He seemed genuinely shocked. Whoa, cool it down. I was just... You almost killed a toddler with a golf cart. Oh, yeah? He crossed his arms and stuck out his tongue. You're the one who steered us into the bears. She felt the heat rise to her face. I saved that kid's life, you jerk. What else was I supposed to do? They continued to bicker until the fight got physical. The two men in the elevator had to step in and pry them apart. One man looked to the other and groaned. This wasn't in the job description. The elevator jolted again as it came to a halt, putting an abrupt end to the fight. Feeling anxious all over again, Annie held her breath, unsure of what to expect. She had seen enough sci-fi films to imagine what an underground prison might look like. Was that what they were headed for? The doors opened, the kids were thrown out. Annie could see nothing but darkness, stumbling forward as she felt another pair of hands grasp her arms. They're your problem now grumbled one of the men. Let's keep it that way, eh? said the other. And with that, the doors closed and the men disappeared.
The two kids found themselves in the dark, unable to make out much aside from figures and shapes. Annie considered the possibility of escaping, but pushed the thought from her mind as her surrounding captors hurried her along the dark tunnel. She didn't have a clue where they were going, or where she would run if she did try to escape, not to mention that they were probably outnumbered. It was a long time before she saw any light, and when it did appear, it was only a dim lantern up ahead. She could see the crate it rested on, and the shape of a woman sitting beside it. The group approached, the light fell to her captors, and then her heart skipped a beat. Something wasn't right. A contrast to the clean suits of the men from the mall, these sentinels wore long, flowing robes. They all had their hoods pulled up, with a scarf over the bottom half of their faces. Their eyes gleamed like a wild animal's in the faint light. Who are these guys? One man emerged from the group and spoke with the guard by the lantern. We found her, he said, gesturing back to Annie. The woman on the stool rose to face her friend. Good, very good. Turning to the rest of the group, she spotted the kid with the orange hair. But who's this? The boy, more irritated than intimidated, shook off the firm hand resting on his shoulder and faced the approaching sentinel. Who wants to know? Ah, uh, the guard removed the mask from her face. It's you, again. She didn't seem too impressed. What did you do this time? Well, wouldn't you like to know? he replied, crossing his arms. I'm not altogether sure that I would, but I'm bound to hear about it sooner or later. She turned her attention back to one of the men. Take him to Bellator, along with the girl. Maybe he'll set the kids straight, for once. The sentinel stepped away from the group, heading towards two large doors just ahead. Taking a set of old keys from her pocket, the guard unlocked a great big bolt and pushed the heavy doors open. They were very large, at least eight feet high, and wide, more of a gate than anything else. The group filed out of the tunnel, each individual nodding to the guard in acknowledgement, who in turn nodded back. It was all so strange from Annie's perspective. Where are we going? She thought, too scared to speak in the presence of the guards. Her eyes were on their cloaks, a mix of black and red that shone as they passed the lantern. She glanced over her shoulder to where the kid was walking behind her, still holding the teddy bear. How did the guard at the gate know who he was? Was it supposed to be a good sign? Annie didn't know but none of it mattered as they stepped through the gate. The darkness of the tunnel had been left behind. There was light, color, and as she lifted her gaze, she was spellbound. They had stepped into another world. Deep underground, the sky was a great big ceiling of dark gray stone. She might have called it a cave, except that it didn't feel like a cave at all. The ceiling was very high, at least six stories tall, and so wide that the walls seemed to fade into the distant darkness. Annie couldn't even see them from where she stood, and the cavern's size was lost to her completely as they continued to what lay within. Everywhere she looked, she saw shops, odd little street shops, like the ones from the familiar city streets way above ground. But Annie knew right away that these were different. Each shop was filled to the brim with fantastic curiosities, overflowing with strange, unimaginable wares. It almost seemed as though the goods themselves were beckoning to her, inviting her to investigate each store and discover its mysteries. And the people... There were crowds of them everywhere, 
where had they come from? Why had they come in the first place? Although many of them seemed normal, for the most part, Annie noticed right away that others were dressed like her entourage in long robes, and there were even more people whose outfits were simply too bold to go unnoticed. It seemed that, upon entering this underground expanse, she had stumbled onto a strange kind of society, a secret world hidden from those who lived in the city far above. She desperately wanted to stop and look at all the beautiful shops, but a gentle push from behind reminded her that she hadn't been brought here to sightsee. She had almost forgotten that she was in trouble. On they went, past countless curiosity shops and their colorful, eccentric owners. The clamor of the market was overwhelming. Even as they passed, Annie heard the vendors crying out to the guards surrounding her. Come, fine sir, a gift for your lady at home, eh? Ah, those robes are looking quite tarnished, no? Why not try out a new cloak? I have a generous offer lined up especially for you, my friend. Stop just a minute, gentlemen. Take a quick break from your noble charge to sample my latest goods. You won't regret it, I guarantee. The eager cries fell upon deaf ears. The sentinels had their hands full and weren't at all willing to be enticed by the chorus of calls. The group continued, heedless of the chaos that surrounded them. The guards had formed a small perimeter around the two kids, making it difficult for Annie to see what was happening, but she still tried to steal a glimpse here and there. She found it strange, enchanting, to see trees all the way underground in this dark market. More enchanting still was how their roots and branches entangled themselves with the storefronts of the little shops as if the streets themselves had grown from the very ground. And as she glanced upwards, she caught the glimmer of lights strung from branch to branch, suspended over the street like lazy fireflies. It was a welcome substitute for the stars that would have shone through the darkness, if not for the ceiling of stone overhead. At last, the group slowed their pace, halting in front of a prominent building, Unlike the surrounding storefronts, this place brought to mind an ancient watchtower reaching up a whole five stories to where it overlooked the market. Annie could see a solitary sentinel on duty, standing way up at the top. But the sight escaped her as they were led inside, the busy market shut away behind a heavy door. Once in the tower, the group dispersed, heading this way and that to complete whatever tasks they had in mind. Only one guard remained to lead the kids away. The man pulled down his mask and took a deep breath, relieved to have escaped the hectic marketplace. Annie stifled a gasp as she saw his eyes. They were bright red. He looked at her, saying nothing. All he did was tip his head to the right, indicating that it was time to keep moving. She didn't need to be told twice, but as she walked ahead she could hear the other kid arguing with the guard just behind her. He sure had some attitude. As they walked down the hall and up the stairs, Annie was overwhelmed a second time, gaping at everything around her. The few electric lights that hung isolated from the ceiling were surrounded by candles, torches, and lanterns, lending a natural warmth to the stone tower. In the absence of windows, there were tapestries along the wall, boasting intricate embroidery that seemed to move with the flickering light. She noticed a repeating symbol woven into their designs, and even on the floor, the carpet had signs of that same pattern. She could make nothing of it, however, and the sight did little to ease her nervousness. Arriving at the second floor from the winding stone staircase, the two were led to another door. The guard knocked, waited for a response from within, and then opened it. He waved his hand, gesturing for the two to enter. 
and although she hesitated, Annie knew that it was too late now to think of escaping. A deep breath, and she stepped forward, with the kid at her heels. At least she wasn't alone. The room was dark compared to the hall. There was one window behind a large desk, and a few other sources of light scattered about, but there were none of those bright electric lights that she had seen downstairs. The fireplace in the corner was the brightest thing in the room, though Annie had to look twice to assure herself that, yes, the flames were violet. This underground world was different from the one she was used to. In the dim light, she hadn't noticed the man beside the mantelpiece. She nearly jumped in surprise when he began to speak. Ah, what a relief, he said. So they managed to find you, that's good. Emerging from the shadows, he made a sweeping motion to the sofa in front of the fireplace. Just wait here a moment, I'll go let Bellator know you've arrived. Exiting the room, he shut the door behind him and left the two alone. Annie obediently took a place on the sofa, saying nothing as she allowed her eyes to scan the spacious office. Everywhere she looked, the walls were covered in papers. There were maps and drawings, pages from books, and the occasional newspaper clipping. From her seat on the sofa, she could read one of the headlines. Market collapses in Nia Natcha. She wondered what it could mean. Still taking in her surroundings, she ignored the other kid as he sat down at the opposite end, hugging the teddy bear close to his chest. She cast a sideways glance in his direction, but looked away before their eyes could meet. She wanted nothing to do with him. For a long while, Neither said a word. The kid kept lifting his head, about to speak, but was unable to break the silence. It was only after a minute or so that his eyes lit up with an idea. Bounding from the sofa, he made his way to the desk and grabbed a pen, fingering the blank tag on the bear. He scribbled something onto the tag and returned to his seat. Placing the bear in the gap between them, he tapped Annie's knee. Finally, she turned to him, reaching for the bear as she eyed the message on the tag. Sorry. She scowled and threw it right back. Apology not accepted. Why you gotta be like that? He slumped down and hugged the bear. Some thanks I get for saving you and all that. She clenched her fists and turned away. You didn't save me from anything, genius. We got caught. He shrugged. Okay, so maybe the rescue plan could have been a bit better. But still, that was one heck of a first kiss, right? It was disgusting, she replied haughtily. And completely unnecessary. And it didn't work. At all. But then something occurred to her. Hey, what do you mean, heck of a first kiss? Hmm, I'll have you know that my kisses are high-end. Not my fault you have a bad taste in smooching. No, not that. How did you know it was my first kiss? He yawned and stretched out his legs. It was sloppy. She was about to deal a snarky reply when the door swung open. Sitting to attention, they both turned to face the incoming stranger. He was tall, with slick black hair flecked with a touch of gray. Forsaking the customary cloak, he was wearing a collared shirt with an expensive jacket. Paired with a heavy frown, he looked intimidating. This guy had to be the boss but his firm expression vanished into annoyance as his gaze fell on the sofa. With a weary sigh, he turned to the kid with the orange hair. Kitsune Mustalini, he said. I should have known the moment they mentioned the golf cart. The kid rose and took a bow. No need to be so formal, Bellator. He straightened out with a smirk. Kit will do. 
You're in here far too often for your own good. He thrust a finger in his face. You're lucky that my men picked you up. Do you know how much trouble you would be in if the overworld police had got there first? Your little excursion is likely to be on television tonight. The heavy frown returned. I'm afraid you won't be leaving the market for some time. Not after an incident like this. Oh, dratters, said Kit, blatantly unconcerned. Looks like I'll have to entertain myself around here from now on. Got any golf carts handy? Listen here, kid. He stepped forward and grasped his shoulder. You're walking a very fine line. One more misadventure and you'll end up behind thick concrete walls for a good long time. Now that would be unfortunate, he replied. It'd be awfully difficult finding some other sucker to supply you and your wife with free tickets to the club. You might even end up, he gasped mockingly, buying them yourself if something like that happened. Reluctant as he was, Bellator released his shoulder and backed off. They should be VIP at this point, he growled. What with all the headaches you've caused me? Sheesh, take it easy. Even I can't swing VIP tickets. Lavinia keeps them all for her boyfriends. Hmm, I'm sure. After this brief exchange, Bellator turned his attention to where Annie was sitting. Would you happen to be Anastasia? She considered lying, but the thought only lasted a moment. The intensity in his eyes gave her the impression that she wouldn't be able to get away with it. Not this time. Yes, she said, deathly afraid of the consequences. But what happened next took her by surprise. With a great sigh of relief, he exclaimed, Thank goodness! Are you all right? This was unexpected. She could barely manage words. It, yes, she stammered. I'm fine, but I don't understand. I thought... Yes, said Bellator, somewhat embarrassed. I have my bumbling overground men to thank for the confusion. They're not what you would call my, uh, brightest division. He cast an angry glance at Kit. It wasn't your fault you were surrounded by idiots. Hey! Kit started flinging insults and excuses back at Bellator, but Annie didn't hear any of it. She fell back in her seat. Oh, she said, rubbing her eyes. I really thought, so I'm not in trouble? No, no, said Bellator. Of course not. He flicked Kit on the nose and turned back to her. Well, not here, anyway. But we do have to talk about above-ground matters now that you're safe. Safe? She frowned. What do you mean, safe? Was I not safe before or something? Uh, yes, he said, noting her concern. That's why I sent my men to pick you up, as soon as I found out that your parents... He halted mid-sentence, glancing at Kit. With another weary sigh, he pointed to the door. Out, he said. You can talk to your friend later. Annie glowered at Kit as he left the room. We're not friends. We're lovers, he added, quickly shutting the door behind him. What? No! She felt her cheeks turn red, this time from embarrassment. We are not lovers! Bellator rolled his eyes and pulled up an armchair. Kitsune is something of a regular around here. I don't know how you got mixed up with him. Come to think of it, neither did she. It was a complete accident, I swear. She paused. Are you the police? He leaned back in his chair and smiled, amused. Yes, I suppose you could call us that. We're like police, except that the bulk of our operations take place underground. We have a few special divisions that keep an eye on the overground as well, but we try to stay inconspicuous. Well, that effort had been a gigantic failure. 
But who are you? If you're not actually police, what do you do? And what is this place? And what were you saying about my parents? He smoothed his hair back, thinking of how to proceed. We have a lot to talk about. I'm assuming you know nothing of this place. Am I right? Annie looked around the room, glancing first out the window and then to the strange fire burning in the corner. Never had she really believed in a place like this. Nothing, she said quietly. All right, then, he said, clasping his hands together with renewed zeal. Steal yourself for what I have to say. I'm afraid it might be a lot to take in at once. He paused. And it may sound crazy. Crazy, she said. I just spent the last couple hours with crazy. I'm ready for things to start making sense. Good. He offered another smile. Then I believe we're on the same page. Hey, hi. I'm your narrator, Miranda Eastwood, also the author of The Truth About Goblins. If you liked this chapter, remember to add, follow, or subscribe to this channel so you can hear the next one. And if you didn't like this chapter, <laughs> oh well, I can't really do anything about that. In any case, I just thought I'd let you know about my Patreon. You can check it out if you'd like to throw some support my way. It would mean a lot to me. Not to mention there's loads of extra exclusive content that I only post on Patreon. While I'm at it, I'll mention that The Truth About Goblins is now available as a complete audiobook, and you can get it wherever you get your audiobooks. Thanks for listening! <laughs>